Well, good morning, West Springs Church. We're so glad that you could be with us uh, worshiping this morning. And um, we'd love to hear from you, so feel free to use the comment section to say hello to each other. Uh, say uh, good morning from wherever you are and uh, let people know what you're thinking about. Uh, we like singing new songs here, but this morning we're going to sing a couple old songs. And um, the first two that we're going to sing were written by Charles Wesley. Uh, his brother was uh, John Wesley, who was kind of the founder of the Methodist movement. And um, in his original hymnals, he had seven rules for worship. And they were instructions, but the seventh rule I just want to share with you before we sing. And he said this was the most important. Above all, to sing spiritually. Have an eye to God in every word you sing. Aim at pleasing him more than yourself or any other creature. In order to attend this strictly to the sense of what you sing and see that your heart is not carried away with the sound but offered to God continually. Mm -hmm. So let's do that as we sing this morning. If these songs are familiar to you, enjoy. And if they're new to you, uh, listen to the words and enjoy these timeless truths.
Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your goodness and your love towards us. Thank you that uh, we can approach, we can approach you, even though that you're the king of the universe, the king of heaven, you've invited us in, and we can approach you. Uh, you want fellowship with us. You want a relationship with us. Oh, thank you for that. And Lord, this morning as we continue to worship in song and and praying and, and hearing from your word. God, I ask that uh, you would open our ears and our hearts, um, that our spirits would be open and tuned into you. And if there's needs, uh, we pray that your presence would be felt this morning and we'd know that you're at work in our life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. I just wanted to uh, remind us of some announcements this morning. Um, actually, I think I can do this. Um, the first announcement, the cooking night. We did a family online cooking class uh, hosted by Rochelle Babcock. Uh, this past, it was Friday, so a couple nights ago. And it was so much fun. It was so fantastic. We got to cook um, some gnocchi. I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, and my kids ate it. I was just so excited. It was so good. And it was lovely to be together as a group of people. I think there was about 10 families all together. Um, so we had a lot of fun. Now keep in mind, we will have more events coming. Um, there's something in the works for the end of March. So I'm just nailing down a couple of details and then I will be sure to let you know, but I promise you it's going to be so much fun. So good together. Uh, the next thing I wanted to mention was the ladies' hot topic discussion nights. Um, the next one is tomorrow at 7. If you uh, don't have an invite, make sure to email connect at westsprings.church and ask for a Zoom link to be able to join us. I believe the topic is mental health and the Christian response. So I'm very excited. I'm going to be there. Um, and I'm just so um, looking forward to what we all have to say and what we can come up with together. Lastly, I wanted to mention there is another book uh, for the book club. Uh, it's called Faith After Doubt by Brian McLaren. And so if you want to be a part of the book club, uh, make sure to email connect at westsprings.church. Let them know that you are um, joining and grab the book, read the book. And the very first discussion meeting for that will be on April 1st. 
April Fool's Day, don't worry, it's not a, a joke. There will be um, a discussion that night. So make sure to join along. Thanks. Well, this morning we have a special announcement and uh, we're very happy to uh, be able to present this um, to Laura Lee this morning. Um, Laura Lee has a applied to be a, for a lay leadership license in our church. And uh, that means she's taking a step in the direction of being commissioned or being ordained in the Free Methodist Church. Uh, the board team, we, uh, we looked at it, we talked about it, and we want to affirm uh, your gift of leadership and your giftedness in that area. And it's our blessing for the church that you use that gift with us and, and with our children. So here is uh, the big envelope, and it contains your lay leadership license. Uh, but uh, thank you, Laura Lee. Good morning, church. My name is Lori Hackett, and I'm doing the Bible reading this morning from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23 from the New Living Translation. And this is Paul's prayer for spiritual wisdom. Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I've not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you'll understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all the things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ, who fills all things everywhere with himself. May you all have a blessed day. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest. Here in the death of Christ. 
everyone. It's great to be in church this morning. I wish you all could be here. The sun is shining. It's gorgeous. There's seven of us, but maybe one day soon we'll be able to be in person again together. Thanks, worship team. That was a blast from the past, uh, but it was good to hear some of those old Methodist hymns again. Thanks a lot. Um, I want to start, first of all, with a, a quick um, note of congratulations and a little promo. Um, some of you who are friends of Caitlin Bangs and, and follow her on social media know that this is a big weekend for her. She is now an officially published author of children's books. And I think this is the launch weekend for it. It's already on Amazon. It's called Marvelous Macy. And it really came out of a time in their lives uh, as they traveled with their young daughter, Macy, through some serious illness and challenges. Um, and we at West Springs Church were very privileged to be part of uh, those who walked with the Bangs and family through those really challenging days. So we are excited. I know that Caitlin sees this as an opportunity to reach out and share the hope that they found and the encouragement they found to many, many, many families who are going through similar things. So congratulations, Caitlin. I also want to say just a little promo. You heard the announcement about the book club, the book of the month club. Um, someone said to me she loves how some of our connect groups are what she called fluid groups. That means you can drop in uh, or disappear according to your interest and your, your time availability, and that's what the book club is like. Every month there's a different book, it might be something that interests you, drop in. You're not going to be committed for the next five years. Um, but if it's something that you think that would be an interesting read or that uh, might um, encourage you and challenge you to read uh, deeper and more about your Christian life, then we welcome you to join this group. And uh, so also if you're looking just to check up on Lee Rain, this is going to be a good way for you to, to check on just to exactly what he's been doing in his winter home so far away. He's going to be leading the online discussion April 1st. So that's, our, that's my congratulations and promo. We are into the second week of Lent. Lent, as uh, we've been reminded, is a time when the church every year prepares itself in anticipation of that a weekend of celebrating and remembering um, the sacrifice that our Lord made for this world, Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And I suppose this year, Lent is being observed in many different ways around the world. One of the most common things we hear is people say, well, what are you giving up for Lent? Uh, a friend of mine last week said, this year for Lent, I'm just giving up. And that's how a lot of us are feeling this year after all this long quarantine, many people are beginning uh, to see a little different picture now. Have you heard the singing? Have you heard the sound of a, a song in the air? For the past year, we've, I think many of us have heard a sound that got stuck in our brains, something like that baby shark song, you know, that Chris Burgoyne knows very well, that just gets stuck in your brain. And the song that many in the world have been had stuck in their brain is something about, how are we ever going to get through this? I hate this. Are we going to survive? We're all going to die. <laughs> and maybe even if we survive this, we're all going to be a little crazier than we were. But have you heard a different song starting? It's a song that's more like, when we reopen, what's it going to be like? What's it going to be like? Um, it's it's kind of like being on a long uh, road trip, and you get that persistent whining of, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And then it begins to change, and the conversation is, the first thing I'm going to do when we get there is. And it started. You can hear it. Maybe it's, the arrival of the vaccines. Maybe we're getting into a rhythm of how to do life under quarantine. Maybe it's just spring. But the song has been changing and people are beginning to wonder, what's it gonna look like? 
post-COVID? What's it going to be like to go to a movie? Remember those? <laughs> What's it going to be like to be able to go out to a restaurant and eat at a table with people who are not from your household, who are not in the bubble? What's it going to be like to say to a friend, let's meet at Starbucks? And a lot of churches are beginning to ask, what's it going to be like? We know that churches have really uh, felt the pressure of COVID. They've really been caught in the song of, will we survive? Here's a couple of uh, excerpts from some articles I've read recently and how people are viewing how the church is going to come out of, of the pandemic. And it, it tends to be one of those things that's a lot like the old, is the glass half empty or half full? Here's an article that was in the New York Times a few months ago. <clears throat> COVID-19 has forced congregations across the country to spend time apart. As churches reopen, faith leaders worry at least a few former worshipers want to permanently break up. Is this going to be a pivot point where people who were not heavily engaged choose to completely disengage? The answer to that is probably yes for a significant number of people, said Ed Stetzer, an evangelism expert who serves as executive director of Wheaton College's Billy Graham Center. If this prediction comes true, houses of worship will suffer. Many denominations already face budget shortages and are canceling programs, letting staff go. Churches will need to act fast to stop potential departures, Stetzer said, but figuring out the right solution is a complicated task. I think it was much easier to close your church than it's going to be to reopen it, said Stetzer. The pressure on local churches is real, and we know even the pressure of how do we respond to the pandemic. Do we open, do we close? Do we, do, we, do we defy the rules or do we comply? How do we do ministry? Just in the last three weeks, I've heard of three past, uh, two pastors who have resigned because they just couldn't do it. Don't worry, they're not our pastors. <laughs> I saw concern sweep. Um, pastors who just don't know how to do the ministry anymore. This is very real, and that's what a view of the glass half empty looks like. Here's a different view, one that maybe sees the glass as half full. This was a post on the BBC, from the BBC on January 3rd, just a few weeks ago. Just as the anxieties of 2020 have led many to search for greater meaning in their lives, the pandemic has made it easier for people to explore their spirituality with the move to online religious worship. Like many last March, the pandemic took Michelle Allard by surprise. The 36-year-old from Toronto, Canada, had recently quit her corporate job to pursue an acting career, something she felt was her true calling. With productions halted and no work in sight, Ms. Allard decided to use the spring to explore another calling, her growing interest in spirituality. I guess I kind of felt I was being led all along, she says, looking back in hindsight. Like many millennials, Allard had not attended church in years. She went every Sunday as a child, but when she hit her teenage years, she lost interest. Now with nothing but time on her hands, she decided she would revisit her faith and see if she could find it a home. The pandemic had caused most churches to go from in-person to online services, which made it very easy for her to try out different denominations without feeling awkward. One of the churches Allard visited online was suggested to her by a friend who told her it was a church for people who don't like church. I dropped into their online Sunday service and they were doing a four-part series basically on love and the fact that Jesus is love. And that so resonated with me because I really believe now more than ever, we really do need love. 
Allard has since become a regular member, attending at least one online service a week and plugging into the congregation. In a time when a lot of people are feeling alienated and isolated, I feel so grateful to have found this group of people. It's changed my life. The BBC article uh, finishes by saying, for decades, religious attendance in most parts of the world has been declining, but the pandemic may just be reversing that trend. Hmm. How is the pandemic going to impact the church? That's a question many are asking, including many here at West Springs. We've been asking the question, what is it going to look like when we're able to reopen? In fact, that question was asked just a week ago at our leadership board meeting. Some of you may think that the leadership board has really had an easy year, not having to meet a lot. Well, I can assure you the board has been upholding its monthly uh, business meetings. And in fact, last September or October, I think, it began meeting twice as much. It began meeting uh, for sessions with Jay Mochenko, who many of you know, used to be our pastor in Weyburn, who's gone on to be on faculty at Briarcrest College and is helping churches navigate the new world. And in our session last Sunday night, we ended with him asking us, what do you want West Springs Church to look like? What do you want? West Springs Church to look like when the pandemic's behind us? It's a good question, and I'm sure we've all been mulling it over, and I started mulling it over. And as usual, that question led me to think of other questions, and like all of you, I have my own picture of what the perfect church would be for me. But then I began to ask the question, what does the world want to see in West Springs Church? What does my world want to see? My friends, my extended family, my neighbors, people I know who have left the church long ago. What are they looking for when church reopens? I'm sure all of us, if we were here together or maybe typing in comments online, we would have similar answers that we want to be and we think the world wants us to be a church that's welcoming and open and embracing and forgiving, not judgmental, not weird, um, not old-fashioned, <laughs> a place where people can feel at home. And I think that's true. And I think very often in fact, there's a recent book, come, a, a book that's about to come out that's studying what's happening with people who've left the church, the people that call themselves the nuns. And we're not talking about the Catholic sisters. We're talking about people who do not identify with organized religion. That there is actually data that shows that some of the nuns, a lot of the nuns are sums. They've retained some of their faith. And the pandemic is causing people to look back and say, I really do need to connect with a spiritual community. Well, one of the conclusions of that research said, they are looking and open to reconnecting with communities of faith, but ones that look very different than they were when they left it. But I also had the question, what does Jesus want his church to look like? And that's really where I began to sense some understanding of this whole idea of what do we want the church to look like. I stumbled across a book this week by a French, 20th century French sociologist, philosopher, theologian by the name of Jacques Ellul. And some of you know that that name or have even read his things. He was known especially for writing about the impact of technology on the world, particularly the church. And 
I, I, I'm a little hesitant to bring up his name because I have no idea <laughs> exactly what the body of his work is. And there might be someone who's saying, I can't believe she's going to quote Jacques Ellul. Um, that'd be like quoting Marx or something. I don't know. I have no clue. But one of his earliest writings was called, a little book called The Presence of the Kingdom, where he writes about the role of the church, and the church is you and me followers of Jesus, our role in this world. And we know that there are many tasks that Jesus has given his church, a mission. But a little centered on what is our role as the presence of the kingdom in this world. And he came up with three. First, followers of Jesus, the church, is to be salt. Now, most of us are probably very familiar with that. We're to be the salt of the earth. And Jesus told his followers, you are the salt of the earth. And we know that it's not just adding a little bit of extra oomph to our fries. It's not bringing some taste out in the bland soup. Particularly in that day, salt was an essential ingredient for life, an element for life. It was a preservative. It kept things from rotting. It was a cleanser. It was an antiseptic that allowed healing. So we're aware of that role of being salt in the earth, of, of the earth. But remember Jesus also said, if the salt loses its saltiness, what good is it? And it all goes on with the second one, to drawing specifically from what Jesus told his followers was going to be their role. The second one, you probably guessed it, light. You are the light of the world. And we know that we are here to give light to a dark world. A few years ago, <clears throat> I was on a vacation to, of all places, Haiti. <laughs> um, a friend of ours, many of you know, Tanis Mealy, was working in Haiti at Community Health, and I decided to go and spend about 10 days with Tanis in a little town she was based in, up in the mountains, rural Haiti, called Dessalines. And I know some of you have been there. And during the time I was with Tana, she, she had a little house that she lived in in the community. And it was maybe about maybe two blocks down the hill from the big mission house uh, where the career missionaries lived and the base of the operation. And one night, we were invited up to the house to spend the evening. Went up there, had a great meal, watched a video, played some games, and then got ready to go home. And darkness had fallen. And as we walked out past the patio, the courtyard, and the gates were closed behind us, and the generator was shut off, it was pitch dark. I have never been in such darkness in my life. I'm serious. I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. And Tannis kind of laughed and said, oops, I forgot a flashlight. So she and her husband-to-be, Gary, and I linked arms to walk down that rocky little road to go home. I could see nothing. There was no light. And yet all around me, I heard the voices of people going about their life, felt people brushing by me. <laughs> I mean, I was totally disoriented and a little unnerved because I wasn't even sure how to walk. I mean, I was stumbling. And in the darkness, suddenly there was a ray of light. Down the hill, bobbing and weaving this little light, Yolette, a teenager that had a connection with, with Tannis, had gotten word on the street we were on the way. And she grabbed the flashlight, turned it on, and started coming up towards us to lead us home. That's our role in the world. We're flashlights. Jesus said, you're to be flashlights on the pathway leading people safely home. Right? But as Jesus said, you're the light of the world, but why would you turn on the lamp and put a heavy blanket over it? Or as the children sing, or used to at least, why would you put it under a bushel? What good is it? The third, 
role of the Christian, role of the church, is a surprising one, at least it was to me. It is that we are to be sheep among wolves. When Jesus told his disciples that, he said, I'm sending you out to be sheep among wolves. And certainly, there's an element there of him warning them, perhaps, that all of you are going to meet a violent death serving me. Jesus did in his obedience to God. We know that. He met a very violent death. And all the layers of John the Baptist pointing as Jesus emerged in his public ministry and saying, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus being uh, linked to that figure of Old Testament worship, the Paschal Lamb sacrificed for the atonement of sins. Was he telling his followers, his church, be ready for martyrdom? Possibly, certainly. But let's, let's admit, it's unlikely that any of us is going to be crucified for our faith. It's unlikely, but more likely, that some of us might endure violence. There are people in the world today who are giving their lives because they hold up the name of Jesus. It's real. So what is Jesus saying? Our role in West Springs Church in Calgary is supposed to be when he says you're sheep among the wolves. Nobody wants to be a sheep. <laughs> Even in the school play, no one wants to be a sheep. We want to be the wolf. No one wants to be at the back of the line. We want to be at the front of the line, on the top of the heap. And what Jesus is telling his people, his followers, his church, is you are to be like me, living a life of self-sacrifice in this world that resists God's love. Think of the passage in Philippians chapter 2 that says, even though Jesus was God himself, he didn't hang on to his divine privileges. He gave them up, taking the form of a humble servant and came and walked among us, a lowly servant, obedient to God, obedient even unto the cross. And what Jesus is saying of his followers is your role in this world is to have a self-sacrificial life for love. It means every day. We increasingly pray the prayer of Jesus, not my will, yours, Lord. And we are willing to sacrifice in order to see love come into this world. Three functions of the church. Is that what Jesus wants to see when he looks at us? How in the world do we do such a thing, right? How in the world do we live up to that? I want more and more with all my heart to be a person that when my friends and my neighbors and even the checkout lady at Safeway looks at me, what they're seeing is more of Jesus through all the cracks, and I know how far I have to go. I want my church to be that. The church that I have connected to for so many years of my life, I want it to be a place that people look at us and they say, see Jesus. But how do we get there? I woke up one morning last week thinking about the book of Revelation. <laughs> Lots of people are thinking about the book of Revelation these days, right? But in particular, I was thinking about the first two or three chapters where Jesus is giving a message to his old friend John, the last surviving apostle chosen of the 12. And John tells us he was exiled on the island of Patmos because he was fulfilling his role in the world of being a witness and a testimony of Jesus Christ. And he says it was the Lord's Day, Sunday. 
And I was worshiping in the spirit, and I heard a voice behind me. And when he turns, he sees his old friend Jesus, but Jesus triumphant, victorious, glorified, mighty in power. And Jesus says to John, write down what you're about to see. But first, write down some messages. I have some personal messages to go to seven churches, and he names them. Philadelphia, Sardis, Pergamum, Ephesus. I forget the other two. <laughs> he names these churches, and he says, here's the message for this church. And it's a very personal message about the situations they're facing, an encouragement and admonishment about how they can be the church God calls them to be in the world. You know, scholars, even, even early on, those messages began to be grouped together and circulated all through the church because it was understood that while they were a personal message to a particular congregation, a real congregation, what was really entailed and enfolded in them was a timeless global message to the church of Jesus advising, encouraging, correcting. They're all different messages except for one line. There is one line in every message that is repeated. Anyone who has ears to hear, let him listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Let him listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. When we think about what we're going to look like, what we're going to look like as individuals, as a church, post-quarantine, maybe it begins with listening to the Spirit and understanding what he's saying to the churches, to this church. And that will take all of us. All of us centering our life and putting Jesus Christ at the center of worship, that he's the center of my life. He's the center of your family's life. He's the center of this church's life. Let me close with a story. This is, we know the mission, the task is a big one, but the role that we're to have as believers in Jesus Christ, as, this, as his church, is, it's daunting. We are flawed human beings. Most of us are just trying to get home. But there's also a calling for us to be Jesus so that when people look at us, more and more they're seeing Jesus. The great composer Igor, St Igor Stravinsky was writing an orchestral piece, and in it he put a violin solo, a very intricate, difficult violin solo. And when he began to distribute the music to the orchestra members of one of the finest orchestras in the world, for them to review, the members of the orchestra did their own kind of home practicing and then came to the first full rehearsal. And when they got to the violin solo, the first violin, it was obvious he was struggling, and he was dejected. And after the rehearsal, he came to Stravinsky, and he said, Maestro, I want you to know I understand I am part of one of the best orchestras in the world. I know I am one of the best violin players in the world, and I have spent hours on this piece, and I just can't get it. I just can't get it right. And Stravinsky says, oh, he said, you got it exactly right. You see, I wrote that in a way to hear what it sounds like when someone is trying to play it. That was the whole point of the solo. Maybe God has something like this in mind for us as the church. Last week, Adam reminded us that Jesus said, I will build my church and nothing will come against it. The church will survive. The church will more than survive. The church will be triumphant. 
our scripture reading today that Lori read for us, tells us that everything we need has been given to us, even the same power of resurrection. And when people look at us, do they see Jesus? Or is there something about it that we are hiding Jesus? And maybe what God wants to hear is the sound of us trying. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, this morning as we think about what is to come, we know with great uncertainty that we don't know. But we also know that we are in this world as the presence of your kingdom, and we long to be that. So that when anyone looks at us, more and more they're going to see Jesus in this church, in our own lives. So Holy Spirit, we ask you to give us ears to hear, to understand what you're saying even to West Springs Church right now. And may all of it be for the glory of Jesus Christ and his kingdom. Amen. Amen. Merlette, thank you for that excellent message. I'm, I'm challenged and I'm encouraged. Uh, we serve a God who is a great God. He's the one who was and is and is to come. Let's sing about his faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions,
we've sung some songs together. We've prayed some prayers together. We heard an excellent word. This week, be encouraged and be challenged to hear what God is saying and speaking into your life. Go in peace. Amen.